presentation. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited about um, talking to you. Feel free to uh, pop any questions you have in the chat. I might not be able to get to them immediately, but there will be time for questions afterwards. Um, and I'll talk to you about, well, three kind of different things in these three series, but they're all related to each other. So um, they're all related to um, basically as historical linguists, how do we do our job if we have very, very little data to work with? So today is the first of that series. Here's a QR code if you want the slides. I also put the link in the chat. Um, so the question really is how um, to do historical linguistics with very little data. And in the first lecture today, I'll focus on annotating historical corpora. And then in two weeks time, I'll talk about how to basically get more data and how that helps us as historical linguists as well. And in the third lecture, I'll then bring all of that together by answering some diachronic linguistic research questions, or at least show you how you can use all the information from lecture one and two um, to do that. Um, so how can we gain insight in historical linguistics if we don't have recordings? That is the main question for today. So I'm going to focus on written historical data for today. Um, and this really is um, one of the biggest historical linguistic challenges. And I'm going to talk to you today um, about Yes, this big historical linguistic challenge, but I'm going to talk to you also about how that is very much like climbing a mountain where you also have to overcome lots of different challenges. And not just because I like mountains, but because I think that if you um, approach things in the same way, you can get very far. So first of all, how do you get to that top and why would you get to that top? Well, you want to get a better view of things. You want to get insight in historical linguistics. And if you're at the summit of that mountain, you just see a lot more. So um, how do you get that overview from the top? Well, um, that is where you can see and understand, let's say, from a historical linguistic point of view, the history of specific languages. If you gain more insight, you can gain more insight into, you know, Welsh or Tibetan are the languages that I mainly work with, but any language that you're working with, and I know in Ghent, um, Anna's done a lot of work on historical Germanic languages. There's been historical corpora of English um, for a while, of French, of all sorts of languages. So how do you look into the history of a specific language? But you also may want to get insight into history in general or historical written sources, or you want to maybe learn something about language in general, which historical resources can help you with as well. So the first point is that you need to start climbing from the valley, right? You need to start at the very bottom. And um, the higher you get, the more you will see. This is the basic analogy that I'll keep following here. So on clear days like these um, in Nepal, you actually see a lot, but we can't really count on this though. And especially not as historical linguists, we are very often left literally in the dark. So, and we have to overcome all sorts of challenges um, on the way. For instance, there might not be a trail. We might not see where we are going if we're in a mountain. We might not have a big team of porters or supporters with us. So we have to carry all the load by ourselves. There may not be clear skies or clear directions for where we're going. Um, and we may encounter a lot of people without training who try to do things anyway. So, for historical linguists, really, what we are dealing with is not an awful lot of data, but also, for instance, we have a manuscript, but nobody writes in their manuscript on this bright sunny day or in this nice evening on the 10th of November, I'm writing this down, but please be aware that I'm actually from Holland, but I'm writing this down in English, so my English may not be perfect, and it is the year 2022, but Nobody writes all of that down. We don't have that type of colophon information. 
we very often also don't have in a lot of historical sources um, no clear orthography rules or regularized spelling that can help us when we really want to get to know a language. And um, sometimes we just have no data for a particular region at all. We may have a lot from the north of England, but nothing from the south. And then a hundred years later, it's the reverse, just because of historical accidents like big wars and invasions. So um, we need to take all of these challenges into account as historical linguists. Now, because I know that in the last year, you've actually heard a lot about geographical variation already. I saw that on your website, so I'm not going to talk about geographical variation um, here. I'll talk about other languages and other challenges. So how can we get a better view or a better overview as a historical linguist, like this beautiful clear sky? Well, what we need is we need to get a guide, really. And um, in a historical linguistic perspective, that really means that we need to actually get an annotated corpus to guide us to the secrets of our historical language. Now, creating annotated corpora, unfortunately, is actually, it can be very difficult. It can also be very time consuming. And for all those who've done it, um, they can probably <laughs> Uh, relate to this. And the very, very sad part is that this is a part of our job as historical linguists that is very, very underestimated, also very underappreciated. You can't really just publish this in any journal, even though you spent a year or maybe multiple years on annotating something. So it's very often overlooked, but it's such a crucial part of getting the information that we need. So I just wanted to put these dangerous, dangerous warning sounds out there, but please don't let, let that discourage you because what we need is create these corpora to get better data. So the why, how, and what of annotated corpora. Well, the why, first of all, as I already mentioned, we want to know more about the history of our specific languages, about history in general, maybe the history about specific sources, you know, a specific archive of letters written by a person. Maybe that is what interests us, but maybe we just want to know more about language in general and we want to add to, you know, the 6,500 or so languages that are spoken in the world today. Well, we can add all the historical ones to that and we know an awful lot more about typology. So that is the why, let's say, and um, the answer really is we need to create these corpora. Now, how create these corpora? Well, the first how actually is thinking about how to access them, because um, where will your corpus be available? That is something you need to think of before you start building it. Is it going to be for experts or is it going to be for all users, and then is it expert friendly or is it all user friendly when you actually have created it? Um, how long is it available? And that very much has to do with what if it breaks or let's say what if one of the things that you did is no longer maintained and then it links to something else that you did that then someone retired or someone no longer was engaged with that project. So you need to think about these hows as well before you start building your corpus, your annotated corpus. Now, there's an awful lot to say about that, but because I don't have an awful lot of time today, I'm not going to focus too much on it, but you can always ask me questions in the question period. Um, in general, of course, um, I'm asking all these questions, but how do you make these decisions, right? This is what, you, what should interest you as well. Um, well, I think for all of these decisions, what you need to do is you need to ask yourself, what is the purpose of maybe my paper, first of all, if you need to write a paper, what is the purpose of my project, slightly bigger scale? Is this corpus also maybe going to be useful for other historical linguists? Um, is it maybe going to be useful for all linguists, so not historical linguists? Is it not a specific subgroup? Is it useful for all users? Well, ideally, if we spend an awful lot of time, let's say, into something, we'd like to make it useful for everybody, but we may not be able to cater for everybody. But it is important to ask yourself that question before you start annotating anything. 
And then, of course, you can also be led by what is my specific research question at this time, right? And um, I'll give some examples of that, especially um, in the third lecture. So I think every time you need to make a decision, you sort of need to go back to this. What is your purpose? What are my questions? Who is it for? So the second how, of course, of annotated corpora is how to annotate very concretely. Are we going to not annotate, basically just transcribe a manuscript, for instance, if we're talking about manuscripts? Are we talking about doing everything by hand, manual annotation? Are we going to do everything automatically, just automated computer annotation? Or are we going to take an approach that is called uh, semi-supervised or supervised, where you use some automated methods, but you also do some things by yourself. So you supervise the computer. Now, this is the one that, as you might guess, I'm eventually going to focus on. Um, as I think for historical um, corpora in particular, that is the one that is actually the most useful. But let's talk through the other options as well. So, Again, how do we make decisions? Well, we think about advantages and disadvantages, transcription only, advantage, obviously quick and easy. Um, you don't have to do anything apart from transcribe it. Now, <laughs> depending on what you're transcribing, of course, <laughs> this might not be so quick and easy at all, but for a text that can maybe use some OCR or maybe there's some handwritten text recognition available, this might actually be a quick and easy option. But the disadvantage, of course, is that it is only possible and effective with big digitized data already. Um, otherwise, you may have to just spend an awful lot of time on digitizing it. Um, now, manual annotation in general, of course, it depends a little bit on the level, and we'll talk about this later on in detail. One advantage of doing everything by hand, let's say, adding information by hand, is that usually you're 97% accurate. Now you will ask, well, no, I'm always right. <laughs> but then what if you say that you're right, and then you go to your team member and they say, well, no, this is not an accusative, this is a dative, I'm sure. And then you go to the other person and they say, well, no, this is not... <laughs> So it turns out that even in English, quite simple tasks um, or languages, other languages that are modern and you know, spoken by native speakers, when you ask people to annotate something by hand and then you ask other people to do the same thing, they're not always in agreement. And this is the problem of what they call inter-annotator agreement. And you never get a 100% agreement unless you have a extremely simple task but um, that is usually not the type of task that we're dealing with because that doesn't give you any information. But 97% is very good. So let's not just dismiss that. This is extremely useful. Now, of course, the disadvantage is if you do everything by hand is that it is extremely time consuming. And unfortunately, humans are actually not very consistent when they get tired. So um, not just when they get tired because they've had a long day and they've been annotating things for hours, but also in the long run, maybe you start annotating this text in January and then oh, you have all these other things to do like teaching or a project. And then in April over Easter, you come back to it and you think, ah, yes, what did I decide for this particular? And then you forget. And then unless you've written everything down to the tiniest detail, you'll have to make another decision. And very often that wasn't the same decision and you have to go back. So this is actually something that humans are quite bad at. But on the flip side, computers are very good at being consistent because if you tell them something to do it once, then they can do it over and over and over again. So this is the advantage of automatic annotation, right? It's very quick and consistent and um, you have more information than no annotation, which is also good, right? So note though, that I'm not talking about how accurate it is. So it's not always accurate. And it is also not always possible for historical, very low resource and under-researched languages to do things automatically because 
well, first of all, you'd have to make a tool that actually does this, right? And if you don't have one, um, you're a bit stuck unless you can maybe copy one and we'll talk a little bit more about how to do that. So there's advantages to automatic annotation, but there's also disadvantages. So I think for historical corpora, what is actually um, the best way forward is to go for a semi-supervised approach. And this actually combines sort of quick and targeted um, annotation done by computers, so more information, but also more accuracy because you do sort of control what's going on and every now and then you have a stop and you pause and you see if you maybe need to correct something and adjust something. So you supervise the computer when it's doing stuff. Um, so this actually is a very effective approach um, for historical languages. There is still a disadvantage because it does mean that we need to develop language specific pipelines and tools. Um, so we can't really get rid of that one. So the rest of this talk, I will focus on how to address that one remaining disadvantage. So hopefully whenever you deal with the language where you think, oh, I really need an annotated corpus, you can then sort of use this as a toolkit to build your own corpus. So that was the how of annotated corpora. Moving on now to the what of annotated corpora. So what is annotation and then what is good annotation? So what is annotation? Well, I'm going to um, put metadata and manuals there at the very first, <laughs> um, because uh, if you don't document anything, then you lose it. I have had this many times that I made a decision and I talked to my colleague about, oh, we really should do this for our Welsh corpus. And then we didn't see each other for a month and then we got back to it and we had completely forgotten what decision we made and we couldn't remember what it was based on and it took us half an hour to get back into it because we hadn't written it down. And this is just a terrible situation because you feel like you're not making progress at all. So write everything down, everything you do, no matter how small the detail. Um, so this goes for annotation, but it also goes about the information that you have from your data, right? So maybe you do know where this manuscript is from, or maybe you do know something about the author or when it was written or where it was written. So if you have any kind of metadata like that, make sure that you keep that, don't lose it. Make sure that it is saved somewhere and hopefully in a useful way so that you can access it. So document everything. Um, that is really part of a good, um, a well annotated corpus, I would say. Now, the second bit is of course that you need the text. Um, you might need a transcription if you don't have a digital text yet. So you might need to transcribe your text. And then what you need to think about is about different forms of that text. So do you, for instance, are you dealing with one text that has several manuscript witnesses? Think about texts like the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, for instance. There are so many manuscripts of that, or the Iliad and Homer. You know, there are so many manuscripts of the same texts, and they all have slightly different versions. So what is the text that you're going to annotate? Is that just one manuscript or is that maybe an addition of all of these things together? Um, I'm not going to tell you which is right and which is wrong, right? but you need to think about that decision and you need to document that decision as well. Because if there are different versions, what kind of corpus are you making? And again, you have to take that back to what is my target audience? Because maybe I am very interested in syntax and I don't really care how people spell things, but then, you know, if I make this corpus and I go through the effort of making the corpus, maybe my colleague is very interested in historical phonology. And then if I just regularize all the orthography, then obviously this corpus is not going to be useful. So at least not for them. So you do need to think about this when you start building your corpus and you need to find a balance sometimes because it may not be possible for you to take all of the witnesses into account, in which case that's fine. Maybe you just need one, but you do need to document that and be clear about what you've done. So that's sort of the preliminaries for a good 
um, annotated corpus. Now, what do you actually annotate? Well, you need to, um, and this is something that a lot of people who work with European languages actually don't think of, but for a lot of languages, you do need to think about how you split up words and sentences. So this is something um, that can be quite problematic, but even for European languages, like do you actually, what do you do with clitics or enclitics, proclitics? Do you keep them separate from your word or do you include them? Because in the manuscript they were written together and um, what does it mean if I split them up or if I keep them together? Where can I get the more, more information? So this is important to think about. Um, so word and sentence segmentation. Then you have part of speech tagging, which is basically your sort of morphological layer, let's say. You want to know if things are verbs or nouns, or maybe you want to know very precisely if this is a first person singular indicative present tense form of the verb. So this is information on the morphological level. Then of course you can move on to syntactic annotation and even further to semantic information, pragmatic information, information, structural information, NER standing for named entity recognition. So am I a person or am I an organization or am I a country or am I the name of a city, et cetera. So, um, you can put all of that extra information into your corpus if you want to. Maybe you don't want to have everything, but this is what annotation um, looks like. So that's the what of annotated corpora. And that then leads to the annotation puzzle, as I call it, where you have various things that you may need for your specific project. And the ones that I put together here are ones that I'm going to be talking about in the third lecture. So this not, may not be the exact same thing that you want to focus on in your project, but these are things that are important for my project. So you do have to think about what's important for my project. I need to have some segmentation. I need to think about how to pre-process my corpus a little bit. Um, I need some part of speech tagging. I need some parsing, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe you need only half of the pieces of this puzzle, but maybe you need even more. I mean, this is just what the annotation puzzle uh, looks like for my specific project at the moment. So again, where do we start? We start climbing from the valley, remember that. And we ask ourselves, what is the purpose for each of these steps? What are my specific research questions? So this is how we decide on where to go. So what is my research question? I'm going to quickly look ahead now at the third lecture. So one of my projects, as Anna said, is about egophoricity, which is the linguistically flagging the personal knowledge, experience, or involvement of a conscious self. So this is why this guy is popping up every now and then. We'll come back. So this is my conscious self. In languages like Tibetan or Newar, if you say something that has to do with me from my perspective, then you will use a specific auxiliary or a specific morphine to say this is to do with me. So if I am happy um, or if um, I drink some tea or if I give something to you or if you give something to me, whatever, whenever I as a speaker am in focus, you will use this specific auxiliary verb or this specific morphine. And um, from a diachronic perspective, this is interesting to me because in Old Tibetan, this wasn't there. So this specific egophoricity morpheme or auxiliary wasn't there in older stages. So at some point it emerged and it emerged differently in a lot of different Tibetan languages. So that's why I'm interested in creating a historical corpus that connects all of this. So this is my question. Um, with that in mind, <clears throat> so the question is how did egophoricity let's say grammaticalized or pragmaticalized in various Tibeto-Burman languages. And um, the question then is, well, how to find this conscious self, especially when this is what we are starting with. <clears throat> so the top here is an old Tibetan manuscript and the bottom here is a Newar manuscript, a classical Newar manuscript. So how do we get 
from this manuscript to possible ideas that could grow into this conscious self marker? How do we find traces of it? Well, the morphosyntax of these markers in present languages very often was there in older languages, but the meaning was different and the function was different as well. So this actually means that what we need to do is we need to have some annotation that is very, very rich. We can't just do with morphology. We also need some semantics, some information structure in there. So this is what I call deeply annotated Kokra. So what we're really dealing with for some of the Tibetan languages um, that I'm working with is that we need to start from a manuscript to and go on to a very deeply annotated corpus. And we'll do that through semi-supervised annotation. So these are the old and classical Tibetan manuscripts. And these are the classical Newar manuscripts. So the first step is, of course, that we need to digitize these. Now, for old and classical Tibetan, we're quite lucky because a lot of them are digitized already. But for Newar, we're not so lucky. So um, one of the um, postdocs in our project, Alexander O'Neill, has been working with Transcribus, which is an online tool um, for handwritten text recognition, or HTR. And what it does is you can upload pictures of your manuscript and then you can select what, where the text is. Sometimes it will recognize it automatically already. And then um, you can transcribe it. So now here, I don't know if you're familiar with any South Asian languages. Um, this is in the Prachalit script, which looks a lot like the Devanagari script that is still used for modern day Hindi, for instance but it's not exactly the same. It's a little bit different. Now, what this software does is that at first, what you do is you have all these pictures and then you just manually transcribe it bit by bit. And in this case, there is even a nice font for Prachalit. So what my colleague here has done is just transcribed it in that font, exactly um, what is there. Now, the next step then, if you've done this for a bit, um, Transcribus has a sort of a guideline as if you've done this for a hundred pages, then um, what you can do is uh, feed it into their neural network and their neural network can learn from what you have just given it. And basically it will then start trying to make predictions about, oh, when I encounter something that looks like this, I will transcribe it like this. So um, it will actually make quite accurate predictions after about 100 pages. And um, that means, yes, you will have to do a little bit yourself. So as I said, it's semi-supervised. It's not completely done automatically, but you feed it some information and it means that after 100 pages like this, we can then let the computer do the rest. And yes, it might not be 100% correct. There are still some errors, but it's a lot easier to correct a couple of errors than it is to type everything manually. So of course, you need to find a balance here. How much text do you need? If you have nothing at all, though, this is a great starting point. Um, and very often there might be people out there who already have transcribed a couple of texts, in which case you can maybe use that to train these models. So um, this is um, an example of how this works in Prachalit. If you work with European languages, then you're a lot luckier because um, a lot of these models will work, let's say, not only for German, but also for French. And in historical terms, yes, of course, it will need to get used to, let's say, old French or old Spanish. But um, since the script is all very similar, it will actually make use of the existing models that other people have done. Now, we were not that lucky because there were not that many people working on Prachalit. But if you work with European languages, then this can be a big help because you can actually use all of the material that other people have um, used already. So you may not need to do 100 pages by yourself. You may just have to add a couple for whatever specific handwritten script you're using. Right. Now, 
let's say we have our text, then the next step is that what you actually want to do is create a balanced corpus. And um, this is important because if you do linguistic research, um, you, you, in the ideal situation, you want to generalize a bit from, okay, this is what I found in my, let's say 12th century text or my 18th century text um, from this particular region. And I'd like to say that that goes for the entire 18th century or maybe for the entire 12th century. Um, and we can't do all of the texts and sometimes we don't have a lot of texts. So what we have here, for instance, in Old Tibetan, as you can see, I have merged all of these together um, because we don't really have a lot of information. Now, from the 11th to the 18th century, we're actually quite lucky. I've merged these together, but for every century in between, we do have data. So ideally, if you um, what you do is you take a little sample. For instance, you take 10,000 words or 30,000 words for each century from each different author, or whatever you have. So you can create a good balance in your texts, ideally also balanced by genre, of course, but you can't always do that. So what they did for languages where this is possible, like English, for the Old English corpus, there's um, quite a lot of material available, but instead of doing everything, they actually chosen excerpts that were similar in length for each different sort of region, for each period, as much as possible. Um, and all of them prose, because they wanted to keep that separate from the poetry corpus, because especially if you're doing syntax, there might be some differences there. So ideally you create a balanced corpus and you pick excerpts, but that's not always possible. Sometimes you just work with everything you have. So we try to do that for Tibetan and then different varieties of modern Tibetan. So Sherpa Tibetan, Lomi Tibetan, South Mustang Tibetan, et cetera. Um, and then for Newar, we have classical Newar, which then later on split into Kathmandu, Dolaka, Lalitpur, different modern varieties. And we're trying to get a balance of each of these. So remember, this is my annotation puzzle for my question. Um, and the first thing you then do is what you need, you need to design and document your annotation pipeline. So how am I going to do this step by step? So what we did for our project is divide it into three phases. We had the pre-processing phase, the um, segmentation and part of speech tagging phase, and the syntax and information structure phase. And I'll talk a bit more about this division later. You don't really have to do this exactly the same way. Maybe you have four steps, maybe you only have two steps. It depends on what you need for your corpus. So first I'll focus on pre-processing and what we needed to do. Um, so in our pre-processing stage, we decided to standardize some things and to normalize some things and also to convert the um, Tibetan script that we had in Old Tibetan to um, um, the, the sources that we had were written in a transcribed form, which was not the original Tibetan script we decided to turn that back to the Tibetan script and I'll explain why. So this is our original source text. Um, and we decided that um, in the manuscript here, you see these little flying things on the top and underneath. Well, these are the vowels in the Tibetan script. And the things that are flying off here are both E. Now, as you can see, it's clearly different. This is an E going to the right, and this is an E going to the left. Now, Tibetan scholars have worried about this for the last, well, 50 years or so, and really worried about it, written an awful lot about it, but nobody can find any difference between these E's. So they're used by the same person in the same sentence, in the same word, and it just seems to be some sort of thing that has no linguistic impact whatsoever. Sometimes they feel like writing to the right and sometimes they feel like writing to the left. Now, um, because nobody in the last 50 years has been able to find any distinction, we decided to normalize this because otherwise we would end up with the word Xing, for instance, spelled in two different ways which is not very useful because then it means that, for instance, as soon as a computer needs to recognize Xing and Xing, it doesn't really 
uh, treat those as the same word because it will see that it is spelt differently. So this can lead to all sorts of problems later on. So we decided in this particular case that it would be okay to normalize this spelling to just one she. Now I did say be careful here because sometimes of course, maybe you know the last 50 years of Tibetan scholars have been wrong and there actually is a distinction and now we've just even that that distinction. So again, we need to document what we're doing here and make people aware of the fact that there's something going on. Alternatively, of course, you keep both, but that is extra work. And sometimes you just don't have the capacity to do both and make sure that you have both versions easily available. So how does this uh, work? Well, the input that we get for the old Tibetan is the, as I said, we're lucky that is already transcribed. But unfortunately, the website is not very standardized. There's a lot of things that are not very standardized. So we also standardize it to a what is called the normal Tibetan transcription. It's called Wiley transcription. So we standardize that. And then actually, we decided to convert it to Tibetan script to basically get it back to the Tibetan script. And the reason that was not originally transcribed in the Tibetan script is because in the past, there was no beautiful Tibetan font available in, on the computer when they did all these transcriptions. Now, however, we have a beautiful Tibetan Unicode font. So there really is no reason to read everything in transcription if you can read the Tibetan font. Um, it also means that um, we can actually make the local community very, very happy. And I think this is something that we should sometimes bear in mind, even if we do historical linguistics, and these are not texts that they're working with on a daily basis. For us, actually, concretely, it also means that once we have our annotation manuals ready, we can actually ask Tibetans who are trained in classical Tibetan, because a lot of them, let's face it, are monks and read classical Tibetan texts all the time. They can actually help us then with normalization and annotation. And we have millions of Tibetan texts to annotate. So I'm very grateful for their help, of course. And so we make them very happy because they would never read it in any Romanized form. Um, but sometimes the other decision is the better one. So you do need to, I think, think about it with sort of your academic hat on, but also what does it mean for the community? And especially next week when we talk about fieldwork, I'll talk more about the impact on the community as well. So it's a decision that you have to sort of carefully make. Now, fortunately, it is now very easy. We've also developed a script actually with the help of Elia Wu, um, who works for the um, Tibetan Buddhist um, online archive. It's very easy to convert between the two scripts. So at the moment, it's not even a problem. We could easily convert our corpus from one to the other. Right. So that is the first phase in our annotation pipeline. Now the second phase is um, segmentation and part of speech tagging. I'm going to speed up a little bit here because I think you're sort of aware of the process in general. So first of all, we need, as I said, we need to find the difference between this is a word and that is the next word, which as you can see here in a Tibetan manuscript, well, as you cannot see here in a Tibetan manuscript, you don't know where words start or end. Um, we also don't know where sentences start or end. So that is a problem. And we have that problem both in Tibetan and in Mewar. Now, our solution for this is um, what we actually are doing is there is some syllable structure. You see these dots here in the middle? Well, that indicates a syllable. And we can use our knowledge about the phonotactics of the language in combination with the syllable structure that we see and some morphosyntactic information that we know. So this really, again, this is a semi-supervised. We're now actually putting our, our own knowledge into this. We can combine that with some tools that give labels to certain categories, like taggers, for instance. So what we did is we actually created a syllable tagger that works like a part of speech tagger. So it has all the mechanics of the automatic machine learning advantages. But what it does, it just says, this is the beginning of a syllable or this is the end of a syllable. And then afterwards we combine those syllables into words. So that's how we get our words. We do something very similar with sentences. We use our information about morphosyntax 
to create some rules where it says, well, Cochini, Tibetan, and Newar are verb final languages. So as soon as we hit an inflected verb, we know it's the end of the sentence. So we use that as the end of the sentence mark thing. Um, doesn't always work. You have to have a bit more complex rules, but this is the basic uh, way forward. Now, moving on to part of speech tagging. So the question here is, do you use rule-based taggers? Do you use memory-based taggers, neural network taggers? Do you do this with or without pre or post-processing? Do you do it with or without manual correction? So again, we're back at making this decision. And again, we have to keep our point of view in mind, like where are we and where do we need to go? So we need to make that decision based on that. So for rule-based taggers, the advantage is that they're highly consistent. Um, you can start from zero and they're very good with lots of overt morphology. So if your language has a lot of overt morphology, then you can probably easily write some rules that tell you, oh, this is a first person singular verb, for instance. Also an advantage, you don't need a big GPU computer to do this. Disadvantages, however, is that can be a bit time consuming to write detailed rules for everything. It's not always possible even because depending on the language you're working with, you may not have enough information to do it. And it really is difficult if you don't know the language well at all. So if you're starting to work with a language you don't know yet, then this may not be the easiest way forward. So moving on then to memory-based taggers, well, the advantages here are that you can actually start from almost zero. You need to give it a little bit of information and then the algorithm will remember what you do, hence the memory-based tagger. It is very good with lots of overt morphology, but it doesn't necessarily need it. It can also look at the context. Um, and it's really incrementally very effective. So if you tag a little bit yourself, you put it into the tagger, you get some results, then you correct it, and then it gets better and better and better the more you sort of do it in a semi-supervised way. And again, there's no big computer needed. You can be very quick with this. This advantage is that you, you do need to sort of optimize the settings a little bit and play around with what there's so many different options in these algorithms and you need to play around with those different options a little bit to get better results. But my experience, if you've done them for one language, then they usually transfer very easily from Middle Welsh to Old Catalan to Tibetan. And with the same settings, you get very good results for both. It is um, another disadvantage is that this is an older algorithm. And in the NLP community, this is not considered state of the art or very sexy. So if you go to the NLP conferences with this, at first, they will just say, oh, why are you doing this? We've moved on and say, well, yes, but you've never tried Old Tibetan when you've never tried Middle Welsh. <laughs> um, so that could be considered a disadvantage, but I think it's only initially a disadvantage. As soon as you then present your results, they actually think, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> never thought of that. <laughs> So of course, this is where everyone is buzzing neural taggers, their state-of-the-art, powerful algorithms, et cetera, get extremely good results with extremely little effort, um, mainly for English and other big data languages, right? And they look very impressive because, you know, it seems as if they understand everything. But yeah, so this is the, let's say the AI revolution, the artificial intelligence revolution, but I'd like to argue it's not artificial intelligence. It's, there's no understanding going on. It's artificial knowledge at best. So disadvantages of those, um, the artificial knowledge point comes from the, the fact that there's actually little or often no insight into how and why it works. So you put something in and you get a result, but it is not clear at all how the computer arrived at that result. Now, maybe you're only interested in the result, then it's fine, of course. But as linguists, I think we're often very interested in what happens and why things work. And um, that is a problem with this because we can't see. It's just a black box. You can't actually see what's going on. Another disadvantage is that it requires uh, big computers, GPUs most of the time, um, if you want. To make a little tweak in your system, you need to have it run for another couple of hours on a big computer. And yeah, that, that just is expensive. Let's put it like that. 
So it tends to work much better with big data than it does for very little, let's say, historical low resource languages. So that is the disadvantages, but they are very, very powerful algorithms and you can get very good results. So talking about pre and post processing and manual correction in conjunction now, because I think they do the same type of thing. Um, the advantage is that you can really significantly improve accuracies um, with both of these. Disadvantage is that you need to know something about the language, of course, if you're going to correct your automatic tagger. Um, and it, so it requires some extra effort. So I do think that these stages are important. And, um, but again, what is important for me may not be so important for you. So for old and classical Tibetan, we start from zero. And when we did this, so we tried to use the memory-based tagger, as I said, because you can actually start from almost zero. And we just compared different types of configurations with only 15 part of speech tags or with 79 part of speech tags or with over 100 part of speech tags, et cetera. And we did all Tibetan, classical Tibetan, and very, very little data. As you can see, these corpora only like 300,000 words or 3,000 words, very um, little data. And we compared that to a neural network tagger, um, which got 95.8% accuracy, which is quite good. Um, but sometimes the memory based taggers. Um, were better, like here, for instance. So um, in the end, um, we wanted to increase our tag set even more because we can actually get more information, more linguistic information. So for us, it's not good enough to just say it's a verb or it's a noun or it's a pronoun. We actually want to know, is it the first person singular, indicative, etc. We want that information because for us, it makes our research questions a lot easier afterwards. And the same, actually, these results, um, we did more iterations. And then in the end, actually, the memory-based tagger started to win out for all of the languages that we tried. So Old Catalan, Middle Welsh, um, and Old Irish, we're just starting that now. But we have some preliminary results. Um, so to continue our example, the same sentence here from the Old Tibetan translation of the Ramayana. So um, our part of speech tags are quite detailed. For instance, particle in the universal dependency is just part, but in our tag set, we actually say that this is a topic particle. This is a topic clitic, which means that later on we can use that information, whereas part could be anything. Right, and then we build in one layer here at the end of stage two of manual correction, and we use an online tool called Pira. To that and um, to do that because you can if you correct one of these you can automatically correct all instances in your entire corpus so that was our second stage now moving on to the final stage phase three um here we go back to our annotation puzzle we've done the white bits now but we need to focus on the colored bits we haven't done yet so moving on to syntactic parsing, so which tools? And again, we have manual parsing, but for syntax, you also have the question of dependencies versus constituencies. And I think that really also depends on what type of linguistics you prefer. So um, it is worth knowing that in the NLP world, people only worry about dependencies. Nobody ever does any constituency-based tagging or parsing. So that is a little bit difficult if you come from, let's say, a generative grammar background and you like constituencies. Um, Rule-based chunk parsing is an option, especially if you would like constituencies. And then, of course, there are also machine learning parses in various types and forms. So one question you need to ask, first of all, for your language, is there anything out there? Because let's face it, building parses is difficult. So if there's someone who's done any work on it, please use that first, right? And test it and see if it works. So I'll start with machine learning parsing and this I'll include sort of any neural network, any transfer learning, any zero shot learning. Advantages of this is that you get good results with big well-researched data, very similar to the part of speech tagging. Other advantages is low effort, and really you don't need to even know the language to do this. 
um, which might be slightly worrying from other perspectives, of course. So disadvantages, again, you have little or no insight in how it works. It requires GPUs most of the time, and it tends to work much better with big data. And the focus is only on dependency. So that means that if you want to do constituency parsing, it's not really an easy option. So if you want to do constituency parsing, you can do various things. You can, for instance, use rule-based chunk parsing. Um, and there's some disadvantages there. It requires knowledge of the language. So a little bit of extra effort. You need to know what the structure of the noun phrase is, for instance, or the structure of your prepositional phrase. And it is possible, but it is not very easy if you want to work with empty categories, like null subjects or something like that. The advantages are, though, that it's easy to implement and you can adapt it all the time and the disadvantages can be overcome quite easily as well. You can start from zero. You don't have to feed it any information. You can just start and you don't need any GPUs. So very often this is a good starting point. So this is um, what we decided to do. We, we sort of kept optimizing the workflow and pipeline to get more out of the information that we had. And because we had such detailed part of speech tagging information, it then meant that actually the rule-based parsing was quite straightforward. And we didn't need any sort of fancy neural-based parsing. So we can make noun phrases by using our determiners, adjectives, nouns, you just combine them. Same with prepositional phrases, etc. We can use quotative markers because they're in our part of speech tag set to actually start and end direct and indirect speech. Um, we can use embedded clauses, um, you know, that end with conjunctions or converts in Tibetan, for instance, because we have actually tagged converts separately. And relative clauses in Tibetan, they're actually verbal noun phrases with a genitive. Um, so we can even automatically uh, combine relative clauses like that. So if you have a very rich part of speech tagging layer, you can actually get a lot further with rule-based parsing afterwards. Of course, you can also do like train um, configurational grammars, but you can't start from scratch with those. So that is more difficult. So this is quite a straightforward way if you've done a lot of morphology. So just some examples in Tibetan, of course, we have examples that have to do with yaks, right? So two to three white yaks, yak karpo sumtsola. So la is the post position, it's head final in Tibetan. So the post position comes at the end, but we have our complex noun phrase. So we have three, the three white yaks. We all combine that with a rule into a noun phrase. And then we have this at position or post position lap. And then we can combine that into a tree like this, for instance. Already gave the example of the genitive. So the Lama, another typical Tibetan example, who dwells at the monastery. So Gumpana Shukpe Lama. So Gumpala and um, Shukpa. And then the E here is the genitive marker. So this is the verbal noun and with the genitive marker, this can all be combined just with a simple rule of combine this with this with this. As long as you have your part of speech tags, you can combine that easily into phrases and then you have structure. Um, so we then move on to um, slightly more difficult things like semantic pragmatic and um, information structural annotation. So um, for semantic roles and verbal features, what we actually do is we use a Tibetan valency dictionary. There are dictionaries out there that have information about, oh, I'm a verb and I always take a dative, et cetera. So that is useful information. And we actually use that information to automatically say something about the argument structure and about the semantic roles and whether verbs are intentional, volitional or not. So think about what's out there for your language. Topic focus phrases, I already mentioned, we have a specific topic tag or a specific focus tag that can help. There are other features that, that can help as well. So in Welsh, for instance, we have reduplicated pronouns that are always focused, so that can help. Um, and 
the final thing that I want to demonstrate today is something to do with variability in semantics. So one thing that we are working on right now is to build an animacy classifier. And this is important for our project, and I'll explain that later on. But um, today, I'll just say how we did this. So we did this based on embeddings. And this is very much a sort of state-of-the-art NLP technique that I'd like to introduce here because it can help us. Now, how does this work? It's based on the principle of distributional semantics that goes back to Firth and lots of other people, where you shall know a word by the company it keeps. So the meaning of a word really is derived from the context. That is what it means. So have a quick look at this. And I know this is the point where you're probably falling asleep, so it's good to do a little exercise. What is the word that is missing in this particular place in this corpus? Can you just put it in the chat if you found it? So just look at the sentences. Good moment to wake up. <laughs> and try and find out what the missing word here is. In all of these sentences, there's only one word that is missing in all of these sentences. Now, of course, I haven't chosen this particular word at random, so you can think also about what I said in the beginning of this lecture. So I think this sentence in particular, this one, the slope of the plain or mountain, yes, excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. Of course, mountain is what fits in all of these sentences. Well, how did you know the answer is because you can read the context and you have no other information. But this is basically how these systems work. You get some text, you throw it all in a bag of words, and then you start counting. How often does it occur? Well, you can do that in a very simple way by just making a list, but you can also do that in a more complicated way that says, well, here it, it occurs once before the word love, and then we have here, I occurs once. So you can count all the instances in all the contexts. Now, again, humans get very tired of doing these things consistently, but this is something computers are extremely good at, right? So if it comes to counting and transferring our text, then really what we're doing is we transfer our text to what we call vector representations, which really is just a word, plus all of these numbers that tell you this is the context in which this word occurs. And this basically gives you a hundred dimensions of the use of this particular word. And then the next word again has a hundred dimensions of how this word occurs. So you convert a text, the meaning of a text, let's say, the semantics into numbers. And numbers is something that computers are extremely good at. So they can deal with numbers very, very well. Now, of course, the question is, why is this useful, right? Well, it's useful because that means that you can now not just put morphosyntactic information into your computer, but also semantic information. So it means that, for instance, you can let a computer reason about, well, if Germany is to Berlin, then what is Madrid to Spain, et cetera? So you can make it make predictions. So let's say if a king is to a queen, the same as a man is to a woman. So basically what you get is you have the word for king, you subtract because you have numbers, you subtract the word for man, you add the word for woman, and then you get a queen. So you can do word maths with this, if anything else. You can do all sorts of analogies. So what we did is use that for animacy. So these are all Tibetan words. I've transcribed them so you can read along as I look at them. So these are all Tibetan words for types of birds. Now here we have our crane, we have our chicken, we have our duck, etc. And what I did in this plot is I let the computer reduce these 100 dimensions to something that we can see, which is two dimensions, because we can't see 100 dimensions. So I let it reduce it to two dimensions and show how the, these words relate to each other. And when you force to reduce it to two dimensions, you see that there actually, there are clusters. And there are clusters in this case of all the birds of prey 
are here on that type part of the line. And all the other birds like chickens and ducks and cranes are on this part. So it does seem as if the computer has understood something of the semantics here. Now we can then use that to actually decide whether some things are animals or not. So we have three categories. We have humans who are all appearing here. We have animals who are all appearing here. And then we have all the inanimate things that are sort of not in either of these two categories in between. So that then brings us to our final bit of the annotation. We have animacy added here as well. We have our syntactic information added there as well. And then we do a second round of manual correction, again, with some software that makes it visual. So we look at a tree here so it's easy for us to correct this information. And we can also correct information structure and semantics. Um, we can also optionally, by the way, convert it to dependencies. So people who do like dependency grammar can still use our corpus then. Now there's some opportunities and back to challenges. So opportunities with these embeddings, they improve lots of things. So as soon as you have these word embeddings, all of your other tasks for your corpus actually get better. So part of speech tagging for Tibetan went from 90% to 95% just by adding these word embeddings. So that really is very useful. I'm not gonna talk about all of the examples here, but even the handwritten text recognition that we did for Newar, that my colleague did for Newar, got a lot better as soon as we had these embeddings. There are some problems though, because again, we don't really know how it works. I can show you all these nice numbers, but how does it really work? Difficult. Um, also, is it really meaning? People in NLP love to talk about semantics here, but actually this is just analogical relations. It really, it's not the same as understanding the meaning of something in the way we understand meaning. So that is good to bear in mind, but it can still work, but it's good to bear that in mind. We also need to think about being inclusive and accessible. So how do we give people access to let's say the big computers and the code and all of these things that are necessary for this. And how do we um, make sure that we stay on top of the quality? Because very often, if you have bad inputs, then you get bad output in these computational systems. So we, for instance, um, for something that I did for Old English, you don't have an enormous corpus because you know these Anglo-Saxons were not tweeting all the time. So you don't have endless amounts of data, but you do get a lot of orthography and case ending variations. So just the word for king in Old English can be spelled in so many different ways. And then of course, all of these just mean king, right? Semantically, there's no distinction really. So it's important then to think about that and maybe normalize and lemmatize this corpus before you start doing these other tasks. And then finally, I think it's important to mention some environmental concerns because it's very, very, very energy consuming to train these enormous models. You need big computers for it. So what is the solution? How to go forward? Well, I think we just need to collaborate more. There need to be more conversations and more learning from each other and more training. So you can have nice workshops on creating corpora, for instance, um, or do more training courses like these. Um, more open data, more code. If you share your code and your data, it's very easy. Then you can use my system, I can use your system, etc. And better infrastructure and tools like the Pira tool to annotate things. Um, and just getting more people into, let's say, NLP for historical linguistics, because people in NLP are not always worried about historical linguists because they're so... Um, they're very much focused on modern languages and how can we make computers talk to each other in English, let's say. But it would be nice if some of these people also focus on historical linguistics and bringing this field forward because we can learn a lot from each other. And some more recognition for annotators would be nice. So with that, we have our well annotated corpora and we have already gained a much better view. We've climbed up a lot higher. Um, I'm going to pause here now because we uh, have reached this nice hut. Uh, we still haven't seen the top, but we'll pause here and continue next week. And next week we'll be extending and adapting this pipeline with new fieldwork data and 
um, how to deal with that, um, how to do automatic speech recognition, et cetera, and how to add to our corpora to make our historical linguistic research even better. So thank you very much. Let me know if you have any questions.